I'm very excited now to be sitting down with the founders of Juul, who I know who are making their way over here, the e-cigarette company that is taking over the world, uh, very literally. Um, some of you may know uh, James Monsies and Adam Bowen were um, Stanford alums who uh, years ago started working on Um, who years ago uh, decided to work on creating sort of a cleaner, cooler vaporizer that would fit in people's pockets and sort of, um, you know, uh, evade all the terribleness of smoking. The smell, the standing outside, the slowly but surely killing yourself part. Um, and along the way, they created a cannabis uh, vaporizer called Pax, which, full disclosure, I own and love. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, after that, they um, moved on, they separated from PAX, and they created Juul Labs. Uh, hold on, sorry, I'm trying to find my notes here. Um, and um, Juul is, um, you know, has been sort of trying to take on um, these corporate giants like Philip Morris, and it's doing it handily. And so that's sort of the good news. Uh, the company has reportedly uh, on track to earn like a billion dollars in revenue this year. I don't know if that's something that you're able to confirm. Maybe. <laughs> um, it's uh, got more than 70% of the e-cig market share, which is remarkable in three years' time. And this summer, it was reportedly raising $1.2 billion at a $15 billion valuation. You know, not bad for a three-year-old company. Uh, at the same time, of course, you'd have to live under a rock to not know that the company has been sort of embroiled in uh, you know, tons of controversy. The biggest knock against it being that its product is being adopted um, very quickly by uh, high school students. Um, I have to say, my own 11-year-old started sixth grade a few weeks ago, and he was warned about Juul on the very first day, which is sort of shocking. Uh, in fact, the FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb today said that um, the agency is going to be releasing information in November that shows that uh, adoption by high school teenagers is up 80% year over year. So that's a huge problem. Parents are pissed. Regulators are worried. Um, you know, before we get into the company, which I, I know that you see as a tech company that's focused on reducing harm, I just wondered how you're sort of handling this on a personal level, this firestorm that seems to get worse by the day. Yeah, um, good lead off question. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, yeah, I mean, look, this is quite an experience, um, one that, one that, we never really, we never really knew if it was going to come to fruition or not. But I think we always expected if this was going to really work, it was going to be really hard. Um, we, we were really passionate getting into this about yeah, as smokers ourselves um, to end the end the combustible cigarette for for once and for all. Um, there are a billion uh, smokers globally. In the U.S., there's 38 million um, smokers. We don't see them as much here, right, in the valley. But I'm from St. Louis, and when I grew up, I was a kid and exposed to cigarettes very much the same way. And, and the fascination sort of lived on with me um, for a long time, and I think this story was somewhat the same for Adam. So the passion for us was really to eliminate this, the leading cause of preventable death in the world. Um, half of all long-term smokers will die of smoking-related diseases if we don't do something about this. And unfortunately, along with that comes a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges that have had a very long time to fester and grow um, because we've had a century um, and more of cigarette ownership over this market. And cigarettes are the worst consumer product ever invented, um, but unfortunately also uh, the most popular um, and the most successful. So this was always going to be a big, uh, a big issue to resolve. Um, I think we were really passionate about that. I think what we really didn't expect was this level of unfortunate adoption with um, underage consumers. And that is definitely something that now we take on as our mantle to own. 
And I don't doubt that you never sort of planned for high school students to adopt your product because, you know, it's terrible for business. Um, before we get into the, the controversies and the criticisms, which there are many, I, I just, you know, your story is fascinating from a business perspective. Um, and I just wanted to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit um, so people understand kind of like where the company is. So how many employees do you have at this point? I think we're, we're about, it, it, it's changing very rapidly. At the beginning of this year, we had about 225 employees. Today, we have about 1,100. Wow, okay, and are they mostly in San Francisco or all? Primarily, our biggest offices are in San Francisco, but we have offices in um, multiple cities and multiple countries now. So I know that you're in the UK. What other countries are you in internationally? We just, uh, we're in Israel as well. We've been in Israel for a little while. Um, we just launched Canada recently. Um, we will be launching several more this year before the end of the year. Did Israel ban Juul or is that, did they lift that ban? Uh, no, um, Israel imposed a restriction on the nicotine strength allowable for e-cigarettes. So okay. that includes the 5% version of our product, which we currently sell in the US. Um, but we have since uh, switched to a reduced strength that is compliant with the now effective limit there. Okay. Um, and so 1,100 employees is a lot. What do they do? I mean, what's going on inside of Juul? Um, you know, one of the, honestly, one of the most fun things about this company is um, you know, to the question that had, had a lot of um, <laughs> slant on it earlier. Um, this is an incredibly complicated company, perhaps um, the most we've ever seen and, and perhaps the most that most of our investors have ever seen. Because we build a, and I'm sure there's plenty of people that either invest in or have started hardware companies in this room, and hardware is hard, right, um, just on its own. We are a hardware company. We're a hardware company that makes millions of products a week, um, that sells millions of products a week. We're a hardware company that um, has to produce those products at incredibly high volume, qualify them. We have to make it on automated manufacturing equipment that we build from scratch. We have to qualify that equipment with tools that we build from scratch. We have to work with um, contract manufacturers and vendors that are selling us parts in the tens or hundreds of millions um, on a weekly or monthly basis. We have to do that in multiple countries around the world. We have to comply with regulatory guidelines in many, many different countries. We have to market our products as um, carefully and effectively as possible. We have to communicate um, publicly in as grown up and, um, and um, responsible fashion as possible. I could keep going on. The point is we have an incredible diversity of employees at the company and I think that's one of the most fun things. There's two things that make Jewel an amazing place to work. Um, we're hiring, by the way. Um, <laughs> one, one is the diversity of um, the different jobs that people have there. So there's just an incredible um, amount of cross-functional work that happens at the company. The other is that it's an incredibly mission-driven culture. You can imagine this is a, a cautious job to take, right, for a lot of people. Um, and what that has really meant for us for a really long time is that when we find really bright people that really want to work at this company, they come because they believe in the opportunity to have the biggest impact on public health in the history of the United States or potentially the world. And that's just awesome, right? It makes an incredibly unique culture. Well, it's interesting that you bring it up. I was going to ask uh, because I'd seen a story that came out in Inc. today. Um, that you, and you talked to the reporter, but they did talk to um, an employee um, who didn't offer their name. Um, but they said the morale is actually very high, that the employees really do believe that you never marketed to minors. They think you're going to find a way to stem use uh, adoption by underage um, people. And they also said, and look, we're making money hand over fist. Um, is your perception, I mean, I guess, do you agree with that uh, sort of, were you surprised to see those comments, maybe I should um, you know, um, no, I mean, I, I think that you know, the, the morale is very high. I mean, people are en energized and galvanized to, um, to continue uh, working on, on, um, on this cause, which is um, providing smokers with um, a satisfying alternative and address the challenges that we face head on. Um, I mean, people are really energized to 
um, address the, you know, the issues like like youth usage. Um, so it is, you know, that is an, an accurate kind of reflection of the um, the the vibe at the office right now. And can I ask when you're can you confirm that you raised or were raising 1.2 billion dollars? Is that amount closed? That's confirmed. That's confirmed. Okay. And can I ask where were you going to spend that money? I mean, part of what I'm getting at is I'm wondering about your roadmap. I, I looked at the um, patent office um, files yesterday and I saw that you two have like 110, maybe more, um, patents filed. Um, much of them seem to be centered around what you've already built, but I just wondered, is this eventually a holding company for other products? I think um, the, the core technologies that we've been building are incredibly powerful and could be deployed in other markets. There's no doubt about that. Um, some of our patent filings um, cover some bases outside of the core areas that we, you know, that we're really focused on right now, which is the elimination of smoking from the face of the earth. Um, but you know, look, the mission of this company is exactly that, to eliminate smoking. The reason that it is the mission is that it's the leading cause of preventable death in the world. Um, we're very interested in, and I think conceptually, intellectually, and, and it's just kind of a fun mission to work on daily. Um, we're really interested in the concept of applying the concept of harm reduction and, and bring the power of consumer products to bear on actually making harm reduction work for consumers in a, in, in a lustful and positive way. We think that's a powerful combination. Every time we look at other areas that we could apply some of these technologies, it pales in comparison um, to the impact that this can have on just eliminating smoking. So for the most part, that is our core focus. So sort of pedal to the metal on what you've already built. Um, so, you know, there's been talk to about, you know, people in this audience, there are VCs um, who, you know, may from a business standpoint want to fund you, um, but they can't because of these vice clauses. I I'm just wondering, you know, going forward, you have Fidelity and you have Tiger. Um, do you sort of imagine raising money from outside sources? Could you potentially see going public? Uh, um, uh, an IPO professor from Florida had said, maybe it makes more sense for these guys because then they have shareholders who are gonna be sort of advocates for you and maybe don't want to um, see regulation hurt your, your uh, bottom line. James, maybe? Uh, oh, sure. Sorry, Adam. So, um, y you know, uh, listing the company is certainly a possibility. Continuing to um, to grow it privately. I mean, these are these are um, tactics um, uh, you know that we can uh, that we can employ. Um, but really, we're just focused on growth, um, both domestically and now abroad. Um, so that's that's the primary use of proceeds from the most recent um, raise to um, to the uh, to the question. I mean, we have a ways to go just here in the U.S. Right? Like we're 75% of the e-cigarette market, which sounds like a lot, but we're only four to five percent of the U.S. cigarette market, and that's what we're really out to displace. So we're really just getting started here, um, and we haven't, you know, just scratched the surface um, outside the U.S. where 95 percent of smokers live. Which is remarkable. 95 percent of smokers live outside the U.S. where you're not dealing with the same regulatory issues you are here. Although, uh, I wonder if it's going to be sort of a contagion where people are also worried about their teenagers based on what they're reading in the U.S. Um, so I did obviously want to talk to you about that stuff. One of the the fights you're, um, one of the battles you're having to fight right now is uh, reportedly three lawsuits filed by um, families who say their kids are addicted to uh, the product. Uh, you didn't market it to them as far as you're concerned. Do you feel at all culpable? I, I think any un, any underage use of this product is, um, or frankly, any nicotine product is is frankly unacceptable, and that is a challenge that um, we are more than happy to take on, and and we're excited to take on. Frankly, I think this is this has been way too long standing of an issue um, in the market, and I think this. Things are changing now. We're moving away from a stick that you light on fire and um, beginning to have the ability to apply technology solutions to a, a massive problem that has existed for a really long time. I think that educate, I mean, I think that 
I think that we would encourage parents to help us communicate to their kids that this is an adult problem. This is a massive, massive global problem. There are a billion smokers who need these kinds of solutions. And these changes are happening incredibly rapidly. And it is not unreasonable to be skeptical about our intent because this industry has existed for a very long time doing some incredible harm to people all around the world, including underage use of these products. But we exist to solve these problems, um, and that's what we aim to do. Do you, um, you know, I feel in some ways like you guys can't win, um, but you also launched a $30 million campaign where you're going to sort of try to go in, I think, and educate uh, kids on your product, am I misunderstanding? Um, sorry, what? Well, I, I thought there was sort of a, a, a program that where you were trying to sort of go into schools and educate kids about sort of the dangers of e-vaping or, e, you know, e-cigs. Um, but that seemed to sort of backfire in a way because people said, oh, the tobacco companies did exactly the same things. They weren't effective. They used that those programs as a way to sort of combat, you know, uh, effective tobacco legislation. So they were drawing a very unflattering analogy. Do you feel like there was any, so, you know? So, yeah, so we learned that lesson. And now, <laughs> now backing away from you know, Entirely. Pro proactively engaging with, um, with schools. We, okay. we will develop curricula um, to educate um, uh, educators, you know, mm. school administrators um, um, uh, on t um, uh, vaping products, but we're not pushing that proactively. Okay. Um, and you talked about sort of um, tech uh, sort of helping you to curb use. Can you talk a little bit about that? So um, we were both at uh, the TechCrunch Disrupt event a couple of weeks ago, and um, you brought up a an interesting example, but I wasn't sure if it was um, like what's next in the pipeline or just a possibility, but you talked about um, connecting uh, people's phones with their jewel so that uh, if you were to leave your jewel behind, someone else couldn't pick it up and use it. Uh, but that seemed like a very limited um, case. I mean, like a very you know, unlikely scenario to me. So, so how else would you sort of prevent? Um... Sure. Um, look, that, that is one of many examples of technologies that we can deploy to um, reduce or eliminate these problems. Um, we use that, we've been using that particular example as, as sort of an illustrative um, example of, of many things because frankly, look, we're in the midst of conversations with the FDA. Mm -hmm. We believe very strongly that, um, that some of these technology solutions will be um, huge steps ahead of, where this of how this industry has been able to tackle these challenges um, in the past, or frankly, any adult industry has been able to tackle these challenges in the past. Um, but I, I don't think at this moment we're ready to really talk about specific things. That one example is one that we pulled out because we're happy to talk about it. If you want, we can do that again. Well, uh, no, 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 but so is that, is that happening? Is that that's in process, we're gonna see that in 2019 or is that like a hypothetical? Yeah, so uh, to your point earlier, um, in the, the US is a very, um, it's a very rapidly evolving landscape, as we know from certainly the past couple weeks, um, uh, which is fantastic, quite frankly. I think this is, um, it is a, a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to actually sit down and get ahead of this issue. You can imagine, right, this is a, a venture capital kind of forum here. Um, you can imagine that we would, you know, we, despite the $15 billion valuation, um, that, uh, we have discounts applied to this company, right, because of the risk that, um, you know, that regulatory advancements are going to sort of, you know, push us, sweep us under the rug or any number of things. But look, I think this is a balanced consideration set and um, it's a big issue to be solved and we have this great opportunity to work with the FDA to actually get ahead of this. And you know, in a world of additional clarity, um, that benefits both us as well as the, um, the world's smoking population, no doubt. Um, I may have veered off of your question. Well, that's okay. well I, I also just wondered, so, you know, another thing that's come up, um, I don't know if Jewel has suggested it or it's been suggested that Jewel should do this, is geofencing, which seems sort of like a no-brainer. Oh, um, 
is that something that you're considering and um, like what would you need to do to uh, institute that? that Meaning so that the schools, obviously, you know, kids couldn't vape at school. Yeah, there was, there was an article that speculated about this. You mentioned you were reading some of the patent literature earlier. That is, um, that is an, one of many, many um, patents that have been filed publicly at this point. Um, we've, and look, if you dig even further, you'll see a whole bunch of ex exploration that we've done because we've been working on this issue for a long time. And I think what we're really excited to do is deploy some of these technologies. Unfortunately, the US is, unlikely at this moment to be the, the ground zero for the, de um, for the deployment of some of these um, youth prevention technologies, just because there's a moratorium on new product introductions, but obviously that's, ha that's changing very rapidly. So we have the opportunity for potentially the U.S. to move even more quickly. What we plan to do is ex-U.S., where there isn't a moratorium on new product introductions, to bring some of these new technology solutions to bear first. Um, if we get the opportunity to do it in the U.S., that would be tremendous. Um, I, I guess would it speed? So, so there's a moratorium. So if the FDA wants certain things from you, but there's a moratorium on when you can do it. When does the moratorium expire? Uh, well, the moratorium is basically that no new, impo new, new products can be introduced without FDA's pre-market approval. So it's not that it expires. It's that for any new, new product or changed product to come onto the market, they need to review it and give you the green light first. Do you feel like the FDA has been fair? I feel like you, you're, you two have been sort of telling the, the Juul story and then separately the FDA has been saying, you know, we're not getting the information that we want. Or I feel like they're, they, they're, they paint you as uh, sort of uncooperative. Um, so do you think that they've been fair? Um, you know, I'd say I think we're, you know, we're, we're trying to solve the, pro the same problem as the FDA, actually. I mean, our interests are really aligned in that they want to see smokers move to reduced risk products, uh, you know, as do we, while minimizing the you know, uptake by youth and other um, unintended consequences. So it's, it's really a question of how do we get there collectively, and we, and we need to work with them. We need, we need to work with. Um, and, and are you, because I know what, you've got like 60 days to give them information about like why retailers are not selling these to kids and why you're not selling them in bulk uh, online. So I would think, is, is, so has, has there been sort of an information flow or are you gonna like? Um, yes, the, the idea is that we have, um, within a 60 day window, we will um, get the opportunity actually to, um, to show the FDA our more comprehensive plan. What does that mean when you say get the opportunity? Like you, you can't just sort of like, I, I, just, I honestly don't know how it works. Why can you not do that until 60 days from now? Oh, sorry, it's within a 60 day oh, okay. window. Okay. So we've been actually really looking forward to more high level conversations with the FDA for some time. That hasn't been something that's really materialized at scale. I think that's why this, why this moment is really important for us and for, frankly, the adult smoking population of the world is that this is now going to happen. It's incredibly unfortunate that what it took for that to happen is, is an incredible focus on youth uptake of these products, but frankly, that's the main issue at play here um, right now um, uh, in the news cycle, at least, which is unfortunate because what we'd really love to be front and center here is that there are a billion people globally that are at risk of, of early death if we don't actually deploy safer products into the world. Well, I, I mean, I have no doubt that your company is going to be gigantic. I mean, like you said, there's 95% of the smokers live outside the world. You've talked a little bit about, uh, you also talked about, disrupt, about a, a product that would help smokers dial back their nicotine use over time. So you could, uh, you know, you could make a legitimate case that you are a ces cessation product. I do wonder, why don't you just get rid of, so, you know, you've got the flavored tobaccos, which is what the FDA hates the most. In fact, they said, um, you know, they're thinking about banning uh, flavored products altogether. There's much more evidence to suggest that flavored products uh, entice children to use your product versus help adults switch over to your product. Um, so why not just get rid of that? So I think maybe we both want to answer this one. Um, look, first of all, all options are on the table, and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is, look, this issue has to be resolved. Um, we, we mean that. Um, we have, to your point earlier, we have absolutely no interest in any underage consumer ever using these products. It is detrimental to the mission of the company for that to happen. Um, we are not a major tobacco company. We, don't, we have not saturated this market. We are less than 0.5% of the global tobacco market. So all of this upside will only be achieved if we create goodwill and, you know, and stand out in contrast to the way tobacco companies have traditionally behaved. Um, flavor, you know, removing flavors are certainly on the table, but we, we have not seen evidence that there's causation necessarily for flavors being a lead-in for underage consumers. Cigarettes have been a major problem for underage consumers for some time. What we do see strong evidence of internally is um, is the coral is a much stronger coll correlation for adult consumers staying away from cigarettes as they move further from everything that reminds them of cigarettes in the first place, which includes the taste of cigarettes. Imagine that you're a smoker who's been struggling with this issue for a long time, and you're and you're able to migrate to something that doesn't even remind you of that anymore, that is a miracle, right? It is, it is one of the most pleasing things for us to see um, uh, all day long. And we see this all the time. When, when you see a consumer really migrate away from even the flavor of a cigarette and that becomes uninteresting or unappealing to them, you know they're never gonna go back. And that's what we started this whole thing for in the first place. And that's what flavors stand for. I ask because there's so much uh, information out there that's sort of uh, conflicting. Where, how are you tracking, um, you know, the reasons that smokers are gravitating your products and, and staying? How, how can you say it's because of the flavors versus maybe wanting to quit or just enjoying the? I think very quickly that that is evidence that will, you know, that that is amongst the many, many, many things that we'll be um, sharing with the FDA. Um, okay, I know we're out of time. I did want to ask you, um, because I think you are, uh, you know, have a rocket ship. Have you talked to the tobacco companies? Have, have you, like, fielded any uh, takeover offers? So, so, you know, we know many folks in the tobacco industry, um, but we're, you know, we're very proudly independent and continuing to grow the, the company independently. Look, the, uh, obviously the big concern there um, for pretty much anyone, including us, is what does that mean for the mission of the company um, to, to consider partnering with, working with major tobacco companies? We've done that in the past. We actually, many, many years ago, had a partnership with the third largest global tobacco company, and then we um, bought them out of the deal. We parted ways. And, and quite frankly, look, if, if a partnership with a major tobacco company, if frankly any number of things that we could do would accelerate the decline of adult smoking um, and improve the lives of consumers around the world, then we would certainly consider it. We're not necessarily convinced at this moment that that's the move that would make that happen. You're all in the same boat in one sense, which is that the FDA today also said um, it's considering outlawing uh, the sale of tobacco products at all online. I'm just wondering, does that make sense to you? How, how much would that impact your business? Um, I, well, um, so on impact, I mean, the majority of our sales are actually offline. Oh, they are. Um, yeah, conventional brick and mortar. Um, but still, we think that online is a, an important you know, route of access for adult smokers to, um, to get the product. Um, and fortunately, there are very strict age verification uh, technologies that you can employ, and we have you know, the strictest in place. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter that we, you know, we think should be addressed just by employing very rigorous age verification, which we do on, on our own site and any um, e-commerce uh, re resellers that we work with, we require that they, they put those strict controls in as, as well. Great. Guys, thank you so much. I have a million more questions, but I know you've got to go, and I really appreciate your coming and talking to us about your amazing, fascinating company. Thanks. Our thank pleasure. You. Thanks so much.